Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's lovely to see so many of you here. I'm just going to yank that up. Yes, this might need to be a bit higher for me as well, actually. If you, if you give it a bit of a yank. If I give it Tara. a yank? Okay. Ah, there just, it is. That's, that's one of my rules for life. Give something a bit of a yank. Give it a bit of a yank. And then it's going to work. Yeah. How are you all? Well? Okay. Tara, it's, it's just wonderful to meet you after hearing so much about you, seeing you in, in so many different ways over the last few years. And um, since this conversation is about portraiture in, in general, um, I wanted to ask you, first of all, about faces, because here are how many faces? Maybe 70 or 80 different faces. And, and in our lives, every single day, we must see probably thousands mm. of faces unless we just decide to stay in and shut off the world. So and how boring you, would that be? Yeah, so when you see all these faces, do you, do you, for instance, look at a face and you just think, I want to know the story behind that face? Actually, I think I want to make up the story behind that face. Um, I'm one of those people who, who loves faces, loves portraiture. And I think when I was a teenager in Europe, I did spend quite a number of hours in galleries looking at the paintings, but also watching the people and imagining stories behind the figures that I saw, the faces mm. and also the body language and what brought them there that day and what their story might be, what intrigue I can dream up. Yeah, so, so your intrigue was more interesting to you than truth? Yeah, at that stage, yeah. um, I've become quite a bit more interested in current affairs and non-fiction. So um, in the last few years, I've written quite a bit more in, in terms of journalism and non-fiction. But mm. as a teenager, I wanted escape. You know, I loved, um, I loved books. I grew up reading novels when I was 10 years old. I was reading Stephen King mm. and writing Stephen King knockoffs for my classmates at Torquay <laughs> Elementary School. I don't know if any of you remember a book called Christine by Stephen King, there's a couple of nods. It was the 80s. Um, Christine was about a demonic car that ran over and killed the enemies, the, uh, the classmates of its owner yeah. for revenge. And so I wrote a little story called Black and White Doom where a car did precisely that. <laughs> so those were my humble beginnings as, okay. as an author, I suppose, uh, writing for my classmates who at that point, as morbid 10-year-olds, obviously equally morbid 10-year-olds, would actually wait till the end of school to have the handwritten chapter featuring their own grisly demise at the wheels of the car. So that was my kind of not so salubrious beginnings as an author. And so th these, uh, so it was in a sort of Stephen King style, but was it, was it very much based on, on people that you all knew in your life at that time? I wrote all of my friends into yeah. these little novelettes because they wanted to be written in. Um, honestly, I wasn't killing off Johnny in Arbutus Drive because I, I hated him. He was my friend and actually wanted to be written in. And, and to this day, I find that a lot of people do want to be written into my books, mm. regardless of the fact that most people don't fare very well in my novels. They are crime <laughs> novels for the most part, so they tend to reach uh, grisly, grisly ends. But mm. um, I think that's part of the childish kind of morbidity that we all have Mm. somewhere we like to kind of explore these dark areas and it is kind of fun to to feel like you might be a character in a book yeah do you, do you think in your life so far i mean you're still young but do you think that um that in our lives we always go back to what we loved as a child do you feel that that's what you're doing now i i actually think that is the case and i wondered about my youth when I started writing crime. Yeah. Um, back in 1998, when I decided uh, that I was finally going to take my dreams of being a novelist and, and actually work on those and, and, and move towards that, and I was drawn to writing about crime, and I thought back, okay, I wrote horror stories, now I'm writing crime, what is this about, mm. you know? And I grew up in quite a beautiful and idyllic place called uh, Victoria on Vancouver Island on the west coast of Canada. And it's a gorgeous place, you know. Um, the tricycle would be on the front yard, um, on the grass. The doors were left unlocked. Mm -hmm. you know, it was a very beautiful and idyllic upbringing that I had. So I wondered, where did this come from? And I'm really not sure, except, um, except that there was an artist called Edward Gorey, who some yeah. of you might be familiar with. 
Edward Gorey's book, The Gashley Crumb Tinies, is how I learned the alphabet. A is for Amy who fell down the stairs, B is for Basil assaulted by bears, C is for Clara who wasted away, D is for Desmond thrown out of a sleigh, E is for Ernest who choked on a peach, F is for Fanny sucked dry by a leech. Um, this is, oh, don't this stop. is my, no, stop. <laughs> this is my, you know, this was how I engaged with language yeah. um, as a child. So. Yeah. I think my parents had a pretty good sense of humor. Yeah. And um, because my life at that point was so full of love and light and happiness, I felt very comfortable going to the mm. dark places. I loved yeah. Halloween. Each year I would dress up. It was my favorite day of the year. It remains my favorite day of the year mm. because it's a great engagement with the dark side of life, the spiritual or otherwise, and the dark side of ourselves. Mm. It's kind of fun to you know, walk through the cemetery and think of, think of those things because they are, in a sense, they're the flip side, but they make our lives whole. Mm. So I think um, even as a child, I had a sense of, um, almost like a Tim Burton-like sense of the delightfully morbid. It wasn't a, something to be feared. It was something to yeah. kind of engage with and make yourself comfortable with. So I do think we go back to the, our early influences. And for yeah. some reason, for me, those early influences were things like Edward Gorey, Tim Burton, Dracula, mm. the 1931 um, mm. film with Bela Lugosi, as well as the book and Frankenstein. Those, mm. those are my foundations, mm. I suppose. But, but clearly you didn't turn into the sort of person like um, Kevin in We Need to Talk About Kevin, you know, <laughs> who, who obviously became a rather dark mm. character. So, so how, did you, how did you sort of build a, a line? How did you make a line between that very gory gory-esque world mm -hmm. and, um, and the good worlds that you also clearly live in? I think I was able to make, uh, have that definition because I was very lucky, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I had, like I said, a beautiful upbringing in an idyllic place where there wasn't a lot of crime. Yeah. So I was free to watch Perry Mason every lunch hour with my dad and not be connecting with it in the sense of, oh, that could happen to me, yeah. but rather, how interesting, how intriguing, how taboo, you know, it was sort of uh, mm. the sense of otherness. This wasn't the kind of thing teachers talked about, and that's what I liked about it, you know, it was intriguing to me. Mm. Um, it is very different um, now. I've been writing crime for 13 years. Mm. It is. It affects me very differently because once you meet victims of crime, once you read enough case studies, it has a different impact. Mm. Um, but I do think, as human beings, we are all drawn to the dark side in some way. We need to kind of exercise that dark side of ourselves to be human and to be uh, healthy. And for some people, it's the haunted house at the fair. For others, it's um, jumping out of a plane. Mm -hmm. And for still others, it's reading crime or watching horror movies or engaging with the things that give you a bit of a chill or an adrenaline rush. I mm. think we all need to do it. We choose different ways to engage with that. Otherwise, life is just a bit too... Um, well, it's unreal, isn't it? To be cocooned in, in safety and comfort all the time. We know there's more out there. Yeah. So I think we can do that from the safety of our armchairs in many cases. So in terms of your writing... Um, when, when you're creating a portrait of, mm. of a character, let's take one of your most famous characters, Pandora mm. English. Yes. Um, do you develop the character as you're writing it? Is it something mm. that you sort of dis discover yourself as you, as you create the character? Or do you have her character fully formed? Or does she sometimes take you by surprise? Um, all of my characters take me by surprise. Yeah. Um, this character I'm writing at the moment, Pandora English, she's 19, she's an orphan, she comes from a small town, and she comes uh, at the um, invitation of her very mysterious great aunt Celia to New York to live with her in New York. And it's an alternate New York. She lives in a suburb where um, it's surrounded by a kind of mist, a supernatural mist, and this suburb doesn't appear on maps. So in that sense, mm -hmm. everything is possible, and Pandora, like any of us, thrust into that world is, is you know, wide-eyed. So there's a sense of discovery that I get from her, but also in the writing. She's discovering more about herself and her own abilities all the time. 
And that process is very much true for me as the author. Mm -hmm. What is she able to do? She has special talent. She has supernatural abilities, but she doesn't know what they are. And mm -hmm. I don't know what they are. And we can discover that together. So mm -hmm. that's quite an enjoyable process and one I think that relies a great deal on subconscious, mm -hmm. the um, you know, creative flow. Yeah. Whereas with McKady Vanderwall, the, the series that I, the crime series that I write, she began as someone who could be like my fictional sister. So I gave her all of my background so that I knew what tribe she belonged to, you know. I didn't have to second guess what she would think, what she would do. And then over the 13 years I've been writing her, she really did take on her own personality. With Pandora, I've only been writing her for two years, so we're, we're still getting to know each other, and mm. she's getting to know herself. And with Mac, she's had this incredible character arc already. From the first novel, Fetish, she begins with, um, I think she's quite naive in some ways. She's a very strong woman. She's already been through a few things, but she's still naive about the world. And now, five years later in fiction terms, and for me, 13 years later, mm. She's been through so much. She's become, she's almost going to the dark side in a way. The sixth novel I'm writing in that series, Assassin, sees her in a position where she has to become, in a sense, a vigilante. Hmm. So having a, a father who's a cop, that means that she's, you know, she's never considered stepping over that line. That's the law, that's, that's where it begins and ends for her family. Hmm. And yet for her, she's pushed to these extreme circumstances. So. She's changed a lot, she's evolved, and she would absolutely do things that I would never do. Ah. Which I think is also important in a character. How boring would it be if she just did everything I did? What has she done that you wouldn't do? Can you give us an example? Oh, well, um, for my research, I do, um, I do some research into sort of, you know, shooting semi-automatics. Yeah. I learn about poisons, I learn about... Uh, Actually, just hang on a minute, Tara. Can I, can I do a, just a quick check here? Because yes. I'm really curious. Who here has shot a gun? There's a lot. Wow. There's actually quite a few of you. That's Did you come through the metal detector on the way in, or should I be concerned? That's actually really surprising. Are most of those rifles, like sort of country... Okay. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. Uh, actually, I heard yeah. per capita there are more guns in Canada than in America but the guns are different. Okay. They're, they're, they're shotguns that you keep in the shed. Yeah. If a bear comes along, they're not, mm. um, they're not handguns. Um, so I've, I've worked with handguns and semi-automatics and automatics, machine yeah. guns and all of that sort of thing, and so even a Tommy gun. A really, a Tommy gun? Those are impossible to shoot. You know, you know the old um, you know, Al Capone moment, and they're shooting the Tommy gun, and you know, it sort of goes like this. Mm. They do that. The... the there's so much power in it that you can't keep right. the nose of it down. I think it so even did that in Bugsy Malone when they were shooting did. custard. Yeah, absolutely. So you, yeah. you wouldn't want to be really tall because you'd probably get hit by everyone's bullets. As the, they wouldn't be aiming at you, but it would just... You're over, to, oh, over to the left and up is who's going to get hit. So, and I find that the same thing with, um, with an automatic weapon, which I think are very, very scary things. Mm -hmm. Um, I can only really shoot them straight with a grenade launcher on the end, as I discovered. <laughs> I'm not kidding. If you have a grenade launcher on the end, it, it keeps the tip down. Okay. It's just, right. a, it's just one of those little things just I picked up. Just a little tip for you? Yeah. Just one of those Thanks. little things I picked up, that's all. And I'll, I'll share quickly with you my most embarrassing um, story with, in terms of weapons training. I was in Los Angeles um, at the police academy there, and the LAPD were being fantastic. It was a bit of a boys' club at that, on that day, so I was feeling, they were all looking at me thinking, I bet you she can't really shoot a weapon very well. Anyway, I had an H&K semi-automatic that I was shooting, and that was all fine and good, except I was wearing a T-shirt, a standard T-shirt, and when you shoot a weapon, you're supposed to use both hands, so when you see actors on cop shows doing that, no, bad technique, you don't do that, and you also mm. don't come into a room like this, because you're likely to shoot your own head off. So I'm shooting this um, H&K semi-automatic and one of the burning hot spent bullet shells ejects out of the side of the gun, as they do, bounces off the wall, comes back and goes down my top. Oh. Like I said, I'm, I'm wearing a t-shirt and it created a lovely funnel effect at the front and the bullet shell went down there and lodged in my bra and started to burn this scar into me, which I still have. And what do you, what's the first thing you do when you're being burned? 
Well, I started screaming blue murder and waving this loaded 45 oh. HK semi automatic around. <laughs> and the cops were on the ground on their bellies yelling, put the weapon down, put the weapon down. <laughs> so I might not be invited back, but I do have a scar to, to prove that that happened. Which none of you can see, but <laughs> yeah. So, so Tori, if you weren't doing oh. the research for, yeah. for your writing, would you have gone and and learned how to shoot a gun? Do you think? I don't think so. No, um, I don't. I have a respect for weapons in the sense that I understand what they can do, and I think that's probably a healthy thing for most people to understand because it's not like it is in the movies, and it's not like a toy gun. Um, and to this day, even when my husband, for instance, is has got a drill and he he you know, points it like this. I want to actually duck because it reminds me of the shape of a gun. Yeah. So I instinctively cannot have someone even point a, an empty weapon at me. Mm. It's just I cannot stand in front of the barrel of a gun. So mm. I think that's a healthy thing to have an understanding of that. Mm. But um, I believe in very tight gun controls and I never want to own a gun. Statistically, you're more likely to kill someone you love than to actually... Um, use your weapon on someone who's threatening you. So, yeah. you know, that's not a very good stat, and I don't want to mm. be one of those statistics. Mm. So that's one thing that you wouldn't do if you weren't writing. I'm, I'm just kind of wondering whether your writing is, in fact, a way for you to get to know yourself. Is, is, yeah. is that something that you're aware of? Or I should be on a couch here instead of a chair, I think. I'm going to be psychoanalyzed. Um, Look, I think that's probably true. I, yeah. I have, over the years, realized that I, my way of dealing with life is to look my fears in the eye mm. and walk up and acquaint myself intimately with the things I fear because then I no longer fear them. Mm. So I can't honestly off the top of my head say I'm afraid of or phobic of anything in particular. Mm. I've humiliated myself on stage. I've, you know, tripped over in front of people. I've made a fool of myself. Mm. I've, I've um, you know, gone up with the roulettes and done loops over the opera house. Didn't throw up in my helmet, thankfully. But I've done, wow. you know, I've done things which scared me initially. Getting my race car driver's license mm. was frightening, you know, going full bore towards a brick wall and then having to do a hairpin turn. And they're telling you, no, don't break yet, don't break yet, don't break yet. And you're like, you're going... The wall, it's, you know, mm. it's, we're talking split seconds here. That, that is really hard, and, mm. and I'm not ashamed to admit that at one point I did actually go into the change room and have a little bit of a moment, you yeah. know, kind of, I'm really freaked out here, you know, mm. what I'm doing is really on the edge. Or being set on fire, you know, that's the closest I've ever come to being really seriously harmed, and, and it was just a matter of you know, the, the wind making the flames coming off of my body waver enough to, say, make my head catch fire. It's just those little, mm. you know, those little things. We, uh, it's important to, to face those fears, but also I'm sometimes aware that, okay, I've done that one, I've checked that off, I'm not that keen to get set on fire again, you know. It's a, possibly a slightly prosaic question, but yes. why were you set on fire? <laughs> um, that's a very good question. Um, for my fifth crime novel, Siren, I did a lot of very hands-on research. So I've learned in the past about psychopaths, about cops, about investigation, all these different areas. But what I need to do often for a book is also have a physical experience that I can write about. Because mm. I find then the scenes really ring true. And often I, w I look back later and think I would have written that scene differently and wrong had I not had that experience. So for Siren, that was being choked unconscious and being set on fire, though not at the same time. Because I don't think I could have survived that. Um, so I was set on fire by a stunt company in Los Angeles. Yeah. And um, they covered me in um, first aloe, aloe vera, which is cooling. Just hang on a minute. Yeah. How many of you have been set on fire? <laughs> Hopefully none of you. Excellent. Honestly, I don't really mm. recommend it. Um, really? But it's a very exciting 15 seconds. Yeah. And it's a very exciting 15 seconds because after 15 seconds, your skin begins to melt even oh. underneath all of the protection. So, and this was something they told me as I was being lit. So that was interesting. I thought, I hope someone's wearing a stopwatch because I'm going to be in deep trouble. So they covered me in aloe vera, which is cooling, and then um, they dunked a fire retardant uh, shirt in cold water and put it on me. And at first I thought, you guys are just, you know, you're having me on here, this white shirt being dunked in water. But... I thought, I've, I'm on to you guys. Mm. And 
then they covered it in places with flammable gel and they lit the flammable gel with a blowtorch, which was very charming. Mm. And so um, that all went up um, and they told me that I could keep my hair out and I was sensible enough to put my hair back in a ponytail, mm. otherwise I probably wouldn't have any right now. Or my hair would be your length, which it has yeah. been before, but not recently. And uh, so they set me on fire and then they explained that I should tell them as soon as I start to feel the heat. And it's a, quite a surreal experience, can I tell you, to be looking at yourself on fire and not be feeling it. I felt it against my f the skin of my face uh, as if I was sitting too close to a fireplace. Mm. But the rest of me, I couldn't feel it. And after about 12 seconds, I started to feel the heat. Mm. And I told them, and then they sprayed me down, um, like doused me completely. But because I had my hair back, I was all right. If I hadn't had my hair back, I would have lost certainly some hair. Mm. Uh, and it goes, fire is so destructive and moves so quickly. It gave me a great sense of, again, respect for the power of fire. And um, yeah, if they hadn't doused me down quick enough, there would have been a problem. That sounds absolutely but terrifying. It, but it, it was necessary, or I feel it was necessary for the scene in, in the book where yeah. there is uh, fire. And I won't give away the context, but it is in mm. Siren. So you do things because your character and your characters in your books want to do them. Ostensibly, so, yes. Yes, ostensibly. So, so I'm beginning to sort of um, have an idea that, that maybe it's because you want to do them. That <laughs> might it's be, a good excuse. It's, it's probably amateur psychology. But um, So what do you want to do that you're actually going to make one of your characters do, so therefore you have to do it? Oh, what a... Live a what glorious a life in Paris in a beautiful apartment. Okay. Eating croissants yeah. and drinking champagne all day. I need to find a character for whom that is their life's mission so that I can do that. Yes, you do. Um, you need to check that out. Maybe I should start being nicer to myself and be nicer to my characters and then, uh, and then I won't be putting myself through these things. Yeah. But then you've just launched on surely what must be one of the greatest journeys of all, which is being a parent. Yes. Well, that's, that's um, a much more gentle journey so far. Mm. Um, I've loved being a mum since the end of February. So our little girl is eight and a half months old and just gorgeous. And I'm absolutely loving the adventure and also finding that I'm a relaxed parent, which is a relief. Because, mm. of course, you don't know until you're there. Um, and I actually find that having my little girl, Safira, has given me a, um, you know, they, people talk about perspective, that sense of perspective. And what it's done for me in terms of perspective is it's given me a place to go when I feel like I'm not happy about something. If I get a bad review or I have, you know, a high pressure public event that goes wrong or I'm doing live television and I screw up, I can only be hard on myself for so long and my daughter will giggle and laugh and do something and I forget completely about something that I otherwise might have really dwelled on far too much and, mm. and turned over and over in my head previously. So I find it's quite freeing, actually, mm. so far. <laughs> Fantastic. And, and when you look, just to go back to this idea of, of the portrait of a face, when, when you look at your daughter, um, what do you see? I mean, is it, is it, um, is I it see my you want granddad. to be objective? Oh, really? I see my granddad yeah. and I see... My sister, yeah, and I see a bit of my mum, and I see, I see my family. I mean, that's what's mm. quite beautiful, especially as an expat. I'm Australian, an Australian citizen, but I was born in Canada. My family are in Canada, mm. and it's beautiful to see them in my daughter every day. Mm. You know, it, it makes me feel closer to them, especially those of them who have passed away. My mother passed away when I was only a teenager, and my grandfather's no longer with us either. So. It's nice to see that, you know, yeah. like kind of like they're, they're living on there in, in her eyes. Mm. With, with your own life, you, you, for quite a few years, you're a model and a very yeah. famous model. Is that, um, is that something that, let's say, you, your daughter wants mm. to go into that world? <gasps> what, what would you think <laughs> about that? Um, it's certainly not something I would push her into, but yeah. if she's an, a, even half as strong-willed and stubborn as I am and was, I'm sure I'll have no say in whether or not she decides to take that path and what she does with her career and with her life. Um, 
modeling was very good to me because it got me off of Vancouver Island and it, mm. it showed me the world. It showed me galleries in, in Paris and Milan and, and mm. beautiful architecture and people from different cultures, people with different languages, things that a lot of people um, on Vancouver Island don't see. Yeah. So that was, you know, really, it's something I'm very grateful for. But um, also I found after modeling for so long, and it was about 10 years all up, I quit 13 years ago and I was very happy. It felt like it was time. Mm. And as a creative person, I guess um, I love portraiture, I love photographs, I even love fashion. I find fashions can be really wonderful. Mm. But um, you're not the creative person as the model, you're the mannequin. Mm. And so I'll never miss that, but I will, of course, miss you know, the glamour of those moments. Being a writer is certainly not glamorous. Um, but it is something that you have control over as a creative person, and ultimately that's what yeah. fulfills me. I can imagine as a model you kind of have to tuck yourself away mm -hmm. in some ways. Um, do you allow yourself to be quite free when you're writing? As a writer, I need to allow myself a great deal of freedom, mm -hmm. even to the point where um, you know, I have a motto that you don't write it right, just write it and make it right later. It's really important to take all of the restrictions off of yourself as a writer. Mm. Don't think about your audience. Um, don't think about critics. Don't think about people analyzing every word. Just write and then come back to it later and mold and shape it like a sculpture, like, mm. like, a, like putty or clay. Um, whereas if you try to imagine it all beforehand, it's far too terrifying sort of to present a book and say, what do you all think of it? Can't do that while you're writing it. You have to do that later. And I guess as a model, um, you're very removed from your audience. You're um, going to be presented in a one-dimensional fashion, uh, which is... Uh, well, not even two dimensions, just one. I think so, yes. Wow. I think so, because you're presenting a look that someone else has imagined, you know. So I think as a model, um, you're helping other people's creative dreams come true, mm. you know, in a sense. And as a writer, you're making your own creative dreams come true, and that's the difference for me. Yeah. Now, Tara, I know we've got to wind up in just a moment. However, sure. mm. I do know that you have a motorbike license. Yes. I've got a motorbike license. How many people here ride motorbikes? Oh, there's a couple of you. Cool. Fewer people ride motorbikes than have shot a gun. How very interesting. I love, I love um, retro bikes. Okay. Until very recently, I had a, a 900cc Triumph Scrambler, which I love. Beautiful. And I sold it when I was heavily pregnant. It was part yeah. of the deal. And I figured that in a few years, if I really I'm glad you waited until you were heavily pregnant, though. Yes. I, well, I mulled over it for some time. Yeah. And, I, and the idea of it being in the garage collecting dust and unloved for a year, I thought it's not good for the engine anyway, and it will only depreciate. You know that. It, you can't have it sitting there. So I thought, all right, I'll sell it. This will be my big sacrifice. And, and, but I've told myself that if I do really want a, a bike, I'll probably go and get a Bonneville next. I love the Scrambler, but I think a nice. Bonnie will be my next bike. And um, I'll be tearing up the roads in no time, I'm sure. But are you going to wait for 17 and a half years? I don't know. I, I, um, I don't want to put limitations on myself yeah. there. I think um, if the moment hits and it's the right thing to do, yeah. I'll know and I'll go out and get that bike. And yeah. uh, who knows? But of course, as a parent, it does change a little bit. Um, I, I've led a couple of motorcycle rides for breast cancer research, and it, I was quite, uh, not to be morbid, but I was quite taken aback one year when um, the organizer who was on the bike with me, at the uh, not the same bike, but was riding with me the first year, the second year, he was directing traffic because he didn't have a limb anymore. He, he was missing an arm because of a motorcycle accident. And so you, this is the reality of of these things, and you know this in, a, in an abstract mm. sense, of course, we all understand that there are things that we do that are dangerous to some degree, and we try to take calculated risks and not be too reckless. But obviously seeing that, I keep thinking of that when I look at my daughter, and I think I don't, don't know what it, that I want a motorbike at the moment, but I certainly want, wouldn't want to limit myself. If, um, mm. if it takes me again, I'm, I'm gonna jump on that bike and yeah. off I'll go. It sounds like the same sort of respect thing that you've talked about already mm. with the guns and... It's important to understand and danger. I think it's yeah. important to understand death as well. I think as a culture, we sweep it under the carpet, probably to the point where it's a little unhealthy. I think we can mm. live more fully if we understand that we won't always be around. Mm. Tara, final question. 
Um, what do you really want to do that you haven't done yet? I mean, you've already done so many things. Well, I'd like to get a pilot's license. Okay. And I would How like to... How many hear people here fly a plane? <laughs> Um, You've got a lady here who flies a plane. I've thought about um, a helicopter license many yep. times, but I think I'll go for fixed wing. Okay. Because I'd like to travel with my family in a fixed wing plane and okay. write about it. Do like a year just traveling around the world and going through all of those experiences. It's kind of a 10 year plan. Yep. Actually, I'm not thinking of doing this next year because I'm so overwhelmed at the moment with all the, the great things that are happening. But. Yep. Um, it is something I'd really like to do in the next 10 years, travel the world in my own little plane. Beautiful. We'll look up and, and go, there's go there goes Tara It won't be a jet. It won't be a private jet. I'm talking <laughs> a little, you know, it'll be a humble little thing, maybe taped together, but um, I think it'll be a great adventure. Beautiful. Tara Moss, thank you. Thank you very Huge. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah.